morning. If you would like to, um, open your Bibles to Philippians chapter 4, and we're going to read verse 4 through 13, those 10 verses. If you'd like to just listen along, that'd be fine. In the Bible in front of you on the pew, it's on page 1351, if you're interested. Of the 31,000 verses our good Lord has given us, these 10 are probably some of my favorite. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, Whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that you have renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you have been concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I am in need. I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. At this time of the year, we are blessed with a number of folks that are either traveling south for the winter or who are passing through our area, maybe spending a few days. And so we are honored that you are here today. And if this is your first time to worship with us at the South Trail Church of Christ, we encourage you to not just rush off after our worship, but allow us a few minutes to get to know you and encourage you. And we hope that you'll come back and worship with us at every opportunity. Uh, that you have to meet with us. We are thankful uh, for your presence. If you have your Bibles, keep it open there to Philippians 4, and we'll be looking at the passage there that David read so ably a moment ago, and we'll be thinking about some of those thoughts today. As we greet one another, often we will say, how are you? And sometimes we'll say, well, how are you today? Because we realize that feelings change, and our situations may change, with our circumstances on a daily basis. Oftentimes when we say, how are you, we might even think, compared to what? Compared to yesterday or compared to 50 years ago, how are you? Paul says here in Philippians 4, rejoice in the Lord. And he repeats that, he says, always and again, I say rejoice. I heard about a church that the leadership was discussing additional men that might be qualified to serve as shepherds in that congregation. And one of the deacons had this comment. He says, well, regarding this one brother, he said, well, he's a thermometer, not a thermostat. And the others kind of looked at him and he said, well, a thermometer registers the temperature. It doesn't change anything. It, it registers what's going on around it. And so if the situations are changing, when things get hot, it registers that. And when things cool off, it registers that. But a thermostat changes things. A thermostat regulates the environment around it and keeps things where they need to be. What Paul says here in Philippians 4 and verse 4, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice, there's a thermostat. It's something that helps us in how we look at life. What Paul would say in a number of passages is to walk, like he does in Ephesians 5 and verse 2, to walk in love as dear children, just as Christ who loved you and gave himself, sacrificed himself for you. Walk in love. In Colossians 1.10, he would say, to walk worthy of the Lord. In Ephesians 4 and verse 1, to walk worthy of the calling, the vocation in which you were called 
in the Lord. If we understand what it means to be in the Lord, then that helps to regulate all the other things that happen in our lives to help us with the circumstances which invariably are going to change. Have you noticed something? Life doesn't stay the same. Life is not static. Life is continuing and moving and evolving. And yes, that includes aging. Some of you say, you could have gone all day without mentioning that. Yes, life changes. What we see here is that Christians are to rejoice in the Lord. Jesus gave a number of instructions and he talked about happiness. Sometimes people will ask me, they'll say, well, doesn't God want me to be happy? Well, that depends. Depends on what your definition of happiness. Happiness is an emotion that ranges from a state of contentment to a state of intense bliss. And yes, I think God wants you to experience all of those things. There are times that we experience things that don't necessarily bring us intense joy, but it's still good for us. It helps us to see what life really means. And that's what he means by in the Lord. Understanding that God sent Jesus to bless you with a sphere of blessings. What Paul would say in Ephesians 1 and verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. There's the sphere. I can rejoice in the Lord. Because what God has given me spiritually in Christ is better than anything else. So Jesus talks about happiness. He uses the word blessed. The word that Jesus uses for blessed or it is a condition or a state of being blessed. So happiness is not just, well, how do I feel today? Or did I wake up on the right side of the bed? Did I get my favorite breakfast? Did everything start lining up in my favor from the moment that I opened my eyes? That's not happiness. Oh, that might feel good, but that pleasure is fleeting. And again, you've learned that you can't expect that every single day, right? Jesus would say, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of of heaven. And Jesus gave other beatitudes as well. Even after the gospel accounts were written, we have in the book of Acts, verse tw chapter 20 and verse 35, it is more blessed to give than to receive. We love to talk about that right before we take up a collection, right? It's more blessed to give, but we're talking about a lifestyle. We're not just talking about reaching into your wallet. We're not talking about writing a check. We're talking about giving. Serving. In John 13, 17, Jesus, after washing the disciples' feet, he says, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. In Matthew eleven six, 6, Jesus said, blessed is he who is not offended because of me. You see, rejoicing in the Lord is not being offended because of Jesus, but saying, this is the fount of every blessing. I am blessed there was a Puritan who sat down at a, a meager meal of bread and water and he prayed in his prayer. He said, all this and Jesus too? Think about it. Our rejoicing in the Lord is our seeing what God has done. If I looked at my future and I said, you know what? I was doomed because as a sinner... If I had to stand before God on my own, just face God in the day of judgment, I was in trouble. I was going to be terribly embarrassed and God was going to say, I don't know you. Depart. Spend eternity away from me. That's where I was headed. That's where the road that I had chosen was leading until Jesus. Because God sent Jesus, all of a sudden, 
my trajectory changed from going down to going up. Jesus said in Luke eleven twenty eight, 28, Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Once I've received a treasure, what God has told me and what God has revealed, what God has shared and blessed me abundantly in my life in Christ, my direction changed. So what Paul talks about in Philippians 4, after verse 4, is the fact that now that your trajectory has changed, and I can see things a whole lot differently because you know what's in my future? Heaven. You know what's in my future? A home. You know what's in my future? An inheritance. You know what's in my future? A crown, a robe, a mansion, streets of gold, a sea of glass, and the presence of God. And I don't know about you, but if you get caught up in thinking about because you love the beautiful singing of the South Trail Congregation on a Sunday morning, and you start thinking about that heavenly host of angels and what it's going to be like to sing that new song in heaven, and all of a sudden you say, boy, we just can't hold a candle. Let me tell you something. Just keep enjoying the what we've got until we get what we're going to get. All right. Understand that all of that anticipation... The wonder, the reward, the presence of God is all because I'm in Christ. It's all because I understand what Christ came to do for me. And I've believed in Him. I have placed my all in Christ. My entire investment of my soul has been placed in Christ. So I repented of my sins. I made that good confession before others that Jesus is the Son of God savior of the world and I was baptized and when I rose up from that watery grave it was no longer the old Terry some of y'all are going Whew. it's the new Terry and it's the new you to walk a newness of life to yield yourselves so what Paul says is if you've got this right trajectory you've got this right way of thinking look at verse 5 let your gentleness or the way that that word can be translated sometimes is moderation, but it's also translated sweet reasonableness. You ever known somebody, don't look at anybody, but you ever known somebody who was unreasonable? Okay, all right. Sweet reasonableness. You know how we can deal with other people in life? We can be gentle. We can be sweet and reasonable because I'm in the Lord. I don't have to get all upset over somebody else's actions, even when it's wrong, what I can do is I can say, you know what? I can rejoice in the Lord, and I'm going to treat you with the love of Christ, not with the harsh judgment that might come from a soul that doesn't see where it's headed. Verse 6, I know that whatever I need, whatever you need, we, we don't have to be anxious over it. We don't have to worry over things. Dr. Walter Calvert said that only 8% of the things that we worry about are worth worrying about. 92% of the things are either imagined, they never happen, or you can't control it even if you worry about it. What that says is that only one-twelfth of the time, now you can pick which days those are, but only one-twelfth of the time is even worth giving it a second thought. You turn it over to God. Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and, and supplication. Petition. Let your request be made known to God. Did you know God loves you? You say, I knew that. What do you think I am, a novice? What do you think I am, somebody who's, who's not enlightened? Then act like it. If you know God loves you, turn it over to God. Don't carry something that you and I can't carry. I can guarantee you. I was talking to, to one of my family the other day and, and how much they could, they could lift and everything. I guarantee you, if what my boys, sons, sons-in-law, stepsons, what they can lift, I can't lift. Every one of them could put a weight on me that I would be trapped. And life will do that to you if you don't turn it over to God. Look at verse 7. He says, And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds. That right thinking, you see, if I know the right things and I'm known 
to God. That is, I turn things over to God. Then all of a sudden, the only things that I'm thinking are the thoughts that God wants me to think. About Him, about me, about you. It guards your hearts and minds. When I have the wrong thoughts, guess what it does? It's a poison. Look at verse 8. What Paul says is, this is what you ought to think about. The things that are true. You know who, who propagates lies? What Jesus said in John 8, that Satan is the father of lies. And Satan wants you to think lies because you know what that does? That takes your eyes, your mind off of the Lord. And you stop rejoicing and you start, start thinking negatively and sourly. And you know what happens before the next thought? You're sinning. You're sinning because you're thinking the false things, the lies that Satan wants you to think. And Satan snickers. Satan is laughing at you. He's saying, how easy was that? Paul says, whatever things are true, keep your eyes, your mind, your thoughts, your prayers on what's true. Whatever things are noble and just. The idea of worthy of respect and honor. There are things that are worth thinking about and there are things that are not worth thinking about. Then he says, whatever things are pure, lovely, good report. There are some things that are attractive. There are some things that are appealing. Those things are what he says are praiseworthy. Those things are virtuous. Those things are going to help elevate your life. They're going to keep you rejoicing in the Lord. You got to control your thoughts. What Paul said in 2 Corinthians 10, 5 is I got to bring every thought, every imagination into captivity to the obedience of Christ. The moment I let my thoughts get away from me, I'm no longer obedient to Christ. I'm going in a direction that God doesn't want me to go, and I'm yielding myself God's word. You say, well, how do you do that? How do you keep the, the, the true, the noble, the just, the pure, the lovely, the good report? God's word. God's word is a GPS, and it keeps your mind going in the right direction. I need to spend more time thinking about what God says and less time thinking about what Satan and the world tells me. God's word is so pure. It's so, such a treasure. It's so precious that allows us to live with the fullness of rejoicing in the Lord and not getting lost in the weeds. The distractions that the world shows us. You know, a little kid, all you got to do is show him something shiny, okay? And all of a sudden they're mesmerized. Do you realize how Satan treats us like that? He holds up something shiny. I used to love, take the little kids and you could show them a, you could show them a, a dime or a, a nickel. And guess what? They didn't know the value. They didn't know the comparative worth of a dime or a nickel. All right? The nickel's bigger. The kids will reach for the nickel if they're both shiny. All right? Satan does that. The things that have absolutely no eternal value, Satan wants us to start looking at, get caught and get lost in. In verse 9, what Paul says is, these things which you have learned, all right? I, I know y'all don't like tests. Let me explain how this works. We read the Word of God. We experience God's goodness and His grace. We learn what God has told us, and then we get to go out and live it. And just like it was in school, sometimes we, always don't, we don't always score as well in the test. Because you know what happens in between? We forget. You ever studied something, you go in the test, and then you find out what the answer was, and you go, I knew that. No, you didn't. Not at that moment. You put the wrong answer. What happens in our lives is when we go out to live, we forget what God has told us. We still go right back into our old habits, our old thoughts. We're not rejoicing in the Lord always. So all of a sudden our trajectory is no longer set in the direction it should be. Now I'm thinking lower and I'm living like it. In verses 10 to 12 what Paul talks about is the providence of God. You know why we have the Bible. And I know you, you look at that and you say, am I supposed to read all that? Yes. Even back in Genesis. You remember that, 
that poor Joe, Joseph, how his brothers mistreated him, how he ended up down in Egypt, ended up lied about by his employer's wife, ended up in prison, forgotten by his friends. But God had a plan, didn't he? When it was all said and done, where was Joseph? Sitting next to Pharaoh. And he was running things. And providentially, God used Joseph, put him in position that he needed him to be able to save the whole family. You know what we call that? Providence. God sees what we don't see. What we understand is that God leads us. In Psalm 32 and verse, I, 32 and verse 8, I will instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go. And I will guide you with my eye. The word providence means to see beforehand. God leads us with his eye. The Bible is his eye. We see that God cares about his children. God is always involved in their lives. God works things out. In Ephesians 3, the manifold wisdom of God is the gospel. God had it worked out from before time began. He had a plan. He just had to put it into practice. And the people, they did their part that we talk about, we read about in the Bible. The ones who were faithful, they kept keeping their eye on God. And God's eye kept leading them all the way to where he wanted them. God's eye is on you. God's word in the Bible is leading you and showing you the way to go. And you can rejoice in the Lord if you're going with the Lord. If you're walking with him. And so what Paul says there in Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ. When I'm rejoicing in the Lord, when I'm showing sweet reasonableness, gentleness to others, when I'm praying, when I'm letting the peace of God guard my heart and my mind from thinking things that are going to be divisive and, and, and create contention, divide people. And when I let my mind center on the things that are true and just and noble, pure and lovely and of good report. When I'm letting God's providence lead me and I'm not trying to take the reins and take over from God, but I'm letting Him work in my life, I can do all things. It's all in having the right resources. So many times rivers are formed by snow-capped mountains. Lakes are often supported by underground springs. And you know where trees get their food, don't you? The roots. The roots are underground. We don't see the roots. Where are your roots? You say, well, I, I don't know that I have roots. I've got feet. I can move about. Where are you grounded? Where do you draw the source for your life? Are you getting it from God? Are you getting it from the Word of God? You see, if that's your resource, that's unending. God doesn't run out. It's not a scarcity. You know, we talk about supply and demand. Let me tell you something. You have a, a demand, a need for God, and God supplies all and more than you and I can ever absorb, that you and I can ever fully draw or drink into our lives. But we need to have that hunger and thirst for righteousness. We need to be able to keep our thought on what God wants. We need to rejoice in the Lord always, always. And again, I say rejoice. When you think about what he's doing in Philippians, take your Bible there and go back with me a couple of different passages. In chapter 1 and verse 6, be reminded, Paul says, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Don't think God's finished yet. Look at chapter 2. After we talk about that verse, that you know, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, verse 13, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Remember when we said, how are you? Are you happy? If you're living in God's pleasure, you've got reason to be rejoicing. Chapter 3 and verse 10 that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. If I let go of myself and I say, God, it's all you. From now on, it's all you. You're going to rejoice. The things that would bring you down, 
the things that, that might want to turn you into a thermometer instead of a thermostat? No. Your setting is in the Lord. And that's going to keep you. And you can help change others around you because you're living in the Lord. Peter Cropper was a great violinist. The Royal Academy of Music in London awarded him with a lifetime achievement. And they allowed him a privilege that was afforded to very few. They allowed Peter Cropper to play a Stradivarius violin that was 258 years old. And he played a concert in Finland. Peter Cropper was not a young man. He tripped. He fell on top of that priceless Stradivarius. Okay? Some of you are cringing. Peter Cropper was inconsolable. He was devastated. He had destroyed this beautiful instrument. There was a, a master craftsman in England who took that Stradivarius and worked his skill, brought it back to life, and it wasn't just playable. It was, some said, better than new. It played perfect notes. Our lives have been shattered into pieces. But there is a master craftsman who would like to put your life back together and allow you to play the sweet music that God intended for your life to be. We are His workmanship created unto Christ Jesus, created unto good works in Christ Jesus that God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Rejoice in the Lord. Today, are you rejoicing in the Lord? If you've never obeyed the gospel, you can begin rejoicing in the Lord when Christ Jesus lifts the burden of your sins, the sentence of condemnation away from you by having your sins washed in the blood of Jesus, by believing and being baptized into Christ. If you are a Christian, and you've lost that rejoicing, and somehow you've let yourself be a thermometer instead of a thermostat, get the setting back today. Let Christ be all that he wants to be in your life right now. If you need to come, just step down to the front. The Lord invites you. We'd be glad to assist you in your obedience to him. Come now while we stand and while we sing.